Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations, where we talk about hot topic issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Today, we will talk about reparations for slavery, an issue that has been repeatedly advocated by civil rights groups and social justice activists for a very long time. However, it recently became part of the national conversation when presidential candidates made it into a campaign issue. To talk about how the debate surrounding reparations has evolved over time and what are some of the practical and moral considerations that surround it, we are joined today by Professor Amilkar Shabazz. He is a professor of history and Africana studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Professor Shabazz, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, glad to be here. So we'll start at the beginning. Um, so when exactly did the conversation around reparations begin and how has it evolved over time? Very good. It, in one way, we have to situate the, uh, the struggle for reparations on, um, there are two levels we can have this conversation. Mm -hmm. One is on the individual claim of those for, for whom uh, slavery was an act of wrongful taking of people's labor, of people's wealth, of people's productivity. And that individual level can be uh, traced back to the beginnings of, uh, to the first instances of slavery itself. Wherever you had Africans in the Americas who were enslaved that uh, found a way to, uh, to claim their freedom, to press for their freedom, to uh, uh, assert their, their desire to be free. And if an individual slave owner agreed and uh, worked out some arrangement for emancipation, well, right there, a question would, would emerge, how am I to be repaid? How am I to be repaired for all of the years in which I have worked for you? with uh, making nothing for myself. And so then uh, by these arrangements, sometimes a certain amount of, of, uh, of money or land or something to help the, the person who was formerly enslaved be able to uh, um, go on with their lives as, free, as a free person would, would, would happen even then. Mm -hmm. What I think many are looking for in the conversation around reparations is on a group level. And on a group level, we can uh, trace some of this into the middle, middle of the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, particularly in light of the efforts of something called the American Colonization Society, mm -hmm. which was a group that claimed as its members uh, very important figures in the country. Indeed, uh, presidents of the United States mm -hmm. even backed the effort to colonize Africans uh, out of the United States to take them out of the U.S. and to send them back to Africa, notably Liberia, to, uh, to create a black state, uh, in a black Christian state actually, in, in Africa, and that uh, uh, monies and support were, were given for uh, these groups of Africans to return uh, to, to Africa to go to Liberia. Uh, so questions emerged there, but where we really get to the, the full conversation is in the midst of the Civil War and as the war ends. Um, of course, that conversation is largely cut short uh, in the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the uh, U.S. Constitution and the um, uh, the. the the collapse of the Freedmen's Bureau, which has a longer name that included the question of abandoned lands mm -hmm. and uh, um, in, uh, indemnifying Africans who were coming out of slavery with some of the lands that had been abandoned by Confederate slave, by slave owners who supported the Confederacy. So we start really getting a conversation mm -hmm. that, that happens in the context of uh, the Civil War and immediately after the Civil War. And then, so how did, I mean, there were uh, civil rights activists who sort of continued that conversation um, over time, but after a while, it seemed to have died down. Why do you think that is? Well, so one of the things is with, in the case of people who lived through enslavement um, after the Civil War, many of them believed that some form of reparations were, would, would come. Indeed, uh, when we are in the Great Depression years of the 1930s, mm -hmm. um, the work project 
administration uh, creates a program for writers to go uh, south to interview uh, formerly enslaved Africans who were still alive at the time. So these were folks who might have been 5, 10, maybe even 15 years old at the time of uh, the end of the Civil War, um, and so who did live some of their life under, under uh, shadow slavery. Um, they would go down and interview these people in their 80s, in their 90s, about what was life like back then. And uh, we know... Um, in, in many of the instances when these uh, writers would go and ask to, about the interview, the, one of the questions would come up from the formerly enslaved, well, is this, gonna, is this related to my pension? Mm -hmm. You say you're with the federal government, uh, you're supported by the, is this going to lead to my getting my pension? Um, and that was based largely upon the work of an African-American woman who had organized a, and, and had gone uh, around the country organizing African-Americans to press for their rights to reparations in the form of an old age pension. And um, this was um, something, again, that didn't emerge. She ended up being uh, hounded by the, the uh, forerunner of the FBI as uh, having engaged in mail fraud, different fraudulent activities by the people she organized and who were supporting her in her efforts. Um, and so we see even there in the 1930s working among living dis li people who lived through right. this, this act of wrongful taking, um, there were efforts to suppress and to not pay any form of reparations. But the conversation continued. Um, going into the 1940s, mm -hmm. we see efforts with uh, respect to um, uh, W.B. Du Bois and others as at the end of the Second World War and the United Nations is being constructed, um, uh, pressing the case of we charge genocide. Uh, Queen Mother Moore, Audley Moore, was a part of the efforts to, to demand uh, reparations in this charge of, of genocide against the United States government, not only for the era of slavery, but for its ongoing denial of basic human rights to African Americans. Um, and then the civil rights movement coming up to that point, um, there were many instances, um, but uh, uh, James Foreman, a, a, an activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he pressed a case, but not against the U.S. government, but against um, religious uh, bodies mm -hmm. who had sanctioned slavery and who had uh, blessed the efforts of, uh, of, of slaveholders. So the... Uh, um, the, the, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, uh, Presbyterian, Episcopalians, Congregationalists, saying that, look, based on your implication, uh, some of the ministers of these church had owned uh, Africans uh, as, and, and enslaved them, that you should pay back uh, and, and indemnify African Americans as a group. Um, and, and, and further, in 1972, the... Uh, um, group of during the black power era mm -hmm. the provisional government of the republic of new africa had a campaign in 1972 demanding uh, land and demanding uh, uh, independence of the black nation and the repayment of reparations to the payment of reparations to african americans as a group but um so I, there are moments in which um the uh, uh African Americans have pressed this, they've just been ignored, uh, but there has been, I, I would say, um, a consistent efforts through time to make these demands, but uh, in terms of their inaudibility <laughs> by the larger society, yes, there are times when, when it has been less, uh, uh, they've, they've been less receptive. Um, sure. the, uh, um, more, the modern kind of efforts begin to emerge in the 1980s, 1990s, the establishment of the National Coalition uh, f uh, for, of Blacks for Reparations in America, uh, in COBRA, as it's known by its acronym, really pushed a resolution that was uh, put forward in the House of Representatives by um, uh, James uh, John Conyers mm -hmm. of Detroit. And uh, this measure, H.R. 40, called for um, a, a study process to really make an assessment of the wrongful taking and what form of repayment, how much, when uh, uh, could this be, how should this be administered, some type of reparations commission. Mm -hmm. And so Conyers had that bill, but 
uh, failed to get it out of committee, failed to get broader sponsorship for it. There wasn't much uh, much support uh, at that uh, th for for many years. But uh, in more recent times, uh, it has we, we've been able to kind of get get more attention to this. And so, I mean, if we um, talk about reparations for different minority groups in this country, it's not as if the U.S. has never apologized or paid reparations. Um, it was the Reagan administration that apologized and paid reparations to the Japanese Americans for their internment during World War II. The Clinton administration apologized and paid reparations to victims of the Tuskegee experiment. Why do you think that there is such a resist resistance and reluctance around apologizing and then paying reparations for slavery? Um, I'd like to tell a, a little story on that. Um, when I was starting my career as a university teacher, um, I spent a year uh, at Prairie View A&M University. Uh, I uh, was hired um, by a division of political science and history, and uh, my immediate boss was uh, a man who had been an activist in the movement, as well as a political scientist um, named uh, Mac Jones, and then uh, also uh, the first African American woman to receive a PhD in political science was my dean, Ooh. Dean Jewel Prestige. And one of the things we worked on, um, I worked on with uh, uh, Dean Prestige was a grant to uh, bring an, uh, a prominent speaker to campus um, and the person we chose and, and wrote the grant for was uh, John Hope Franklin. Mm. Now John Hope Franklin writes one of the first textbooks in African American history from slavery to freedom. He's well, uh, uh, the, considered the dean of, of, of African American historians, mm. a prominent figure amongst all historians throughout his life. Um, and, and indeed he did come. But because of the work that um, uh, uh, particularly um, Imari Obadeli, uh, who was a professor in the politi uh, political science at Prairie View when I was there, mm -hmm. um, some of the work he did and I uh, worked with of educating the students about reparations, during the Q&A of Professor Franklin's talk, where he was really talking about what was going on in Bosnia and he was relating ethnic conflict there to mm -hmm. ethnic conflict in the United States. Well, a question came up from one of the students about what about the question of reparations for African Americans. And um, at that time, uh, and this would have been about 95, I want to say, mm -hmm. or 96, um, he just slopped it off and said, you know, let's let's be realistic here. Let's talk uh, about things that uh, uh, have have a realistic chance. White Americans don't want to hear anything about reparations, and so this this is just foolishness for us to to uh, spend time here talking about uh, reparations for slavery. Let's or, or for any form of reparations because of the wrongs that have been done for us. Let's let's not waste our time talking foolishness. And and he's an African American professor. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And. Uh, in later years, uh, when I was teaching at, um, in, in Oklahoma, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, near his own hometown, he was born in Oklahoma, he was mm -hmm. born in an all-black town, no white people, no mm -hmm. white people at all, where he, where he grew up. Mm -hmm. and, um, but his father worked in Tulsa as a lawyer, and in 1921, his father's law offices, as well as the whole of what was called Black Wall Street, this mm -hmm. area of black businesses mm -hmm. um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was all burned to the ground. People were run out of, the, black people were run out of the city all over a lie about some black man having um, attempted to rape a white woman mm -hmm. when the, the thing was he had gotten on the elevator and it was a little bit ajar, and he stumbled into a white woman on an elevator, mm. but that became a rape charge. Wow. And he was arrested, he was put in jail, and black people were in Tulsa were just like, we're not letting them kill this man, they're not gonna lynch this man. And so they, they uh, armed up, and they let it be known that they were planning to go to the jail and, and break this guy out if he was not released, mm -hmm. because this was ridiculous. And that's what led to the whites then rioting and, sure. and, and uh, uh, running, trying to run all the blacks out of, out of Tulsa. Well, he being there, his own father losing everything in that, in later years when uh, an attorney, at, at, uh, a law professor at, at Harvard, uh, um, Charles Ogletree, uh, uh, 
friend of mine, we mm -hmm. both taught at the University of Alabama, Al Brophy, mm -hmm. law professor. When all of these and others got involved in bringing the state of Oklahoma and Tulsa up on for reparations, because they were still living descendants of that tragedy of 1921, yeah. um, he finally got on board. Mm. Because part of his thing was, well, if there, in that case, there were still living descendants. I see. And he started changing his tune and started before he, he was dying, beginning to think about the whole reparations sure. issue in broader and more meaningful ways through his own experience of what happened to his father so, um, and his family and mm -hmm. how they were, they were uh, almost ruined by that, sure. by that tragedy. So, you know, it, 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 before even talking about the, the resistance beyond African Americans, yeah. we have to look at the resistance amongst us African Americans. And um, I, partly for me as an educator, I like to think it's an educational problem. As, as we explain more, as we look at, as you say, other cases of mm -hmm. where there have been reparations, um, even where there are no living descendants, but also where there are living descendants in the case of, of Jewish people after World War II, in the case of um, the, uh, 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 the internment of Japanese uh, American citizens in, uh, in World War II, in the case of, of Native Americans. There are Indian nations sure. that, that are, um, uh, have been paid reparations by the U.S. government. In, as we begin to study all of these kinds of instances around the world, um, as we look at how Haiti, after it gained its independence from France, the French demanded reparations from Haiti <laughs> for all of the enslaved Africans that constituted property yeah. for them that they had to be repaid, <laughs> otherwise they would continue to, yeah. to be at war with, with, ha with the Haitian people. So when we look at all of these instances, um, and, and really begin to analyze it. I think that opposition within um, and among African Americans has come down. And I don't know what the polling is, what the most recent polling is, but I think a majority of African Americans are positive about the, the, uh, the conversation so now, uh, now right. on and, reparations. And there was, I mean, there was a very recent polling done, uh, Data for Progress, among the sort of the general U.S. population, but they found that only 26% of the population supported reparations. As a whole for, of the United as, States. As a whole of the United mm -hmm. States uh, supported reparations for slavery. And, you know, some of the um, uh, arguments against paying reparations is, um, you know, includes things like, well, who will be paid? Um, does everybody get the same amount? Um, who are we, uh, who's, you know, needs to pay yeah. for, for reparations yeah. and everything? So how would you respond to those concerns that people have around reparations payment? I think it is a, um, a, a problem that needs to bring together uh, a lot of um, some of the people who really look at this carefully. Um, who can look at it from a standpoint of what would be um, uh, very meaningful ways, both on an individual level as well as a group level for, for reparations. Um, my friend and my mentor, uh, Imari Obadeli, one of his proposals when he was alive mm -hmm. was of reparations that uh, was of a reparations commission that would um, uh, have b process both individual uh, checks, if you mm -hmm. will, individual uh, payments, but also have some of this that could be used to address group issues and mm. group concerns uh, of, of African American people, which they themselves would be empowered to, to vote on and to I study see. and to vote on what kinds of things as a group. For example, um, how do we remember our history? How do we remember um, uh, our, our ancestors that were victimized and, and erect proper monuments and proper uh, ways in, of, of, of being able to study and educate about our past? Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's museums now here and there, but, but what about a fund? Mm -hmm. What about part of the reparations uh, money would, would constitute an endowment that could support those kinds of initiatives to better educate and to provide historical markers and to provide things. That's just one example. Right. Um, so there could be ways in which this commission could look at both uh, ways as a group, uh, uh, certain kinds of things for the entire group of mm -hmm. African Americans that would benefit, but then also how to process 
individual payments. Um, my former teacher, when I was an undergrad, mm -hmm. has uh, uh, put a lot of uh, his intellectual energy on this as an economist mm -hmm. and as a thinker, uh, William Darity. Uh, uh, Sandy Darity has looked at a lot of this, and uh, I think some of his ideas, uh, Richard America, another, actually black economists have been on this <laughs> pro project for, for many, many years looking at what the numbers might look at, how it could be paid out. Um, but so from Richard America all the way to Julianne Malvo and, and, and Sandy Darity, I would say we've got great minds that can help us figure this out. Absolutely, and so, and not, I mean, just in, you know, the form of direct cash payments, but institutional and other ways of being able to sort of address that historical injustice. Um, so, uh, Professor Shabazz, we've talked about how the federal government has apologized and paid reparations for two different communities. What we've recently seen in, you know, recent years is cities and states sort of taking up this initiative in their own communities. So for instance, in 2015, the Chicago City Council uh, paid about $5.5 million to more than 100 black men that the uh, Chicago police had tortured during a certain period of time in the late 1990s or 1980s. And uh, they knew who those individuals were who were victims of that torture and were able to pay them reparations. And the uh, mayor at that time, uh, actually Mayor Rahm Emanuel had also right who's going had mandated that public schools teach about that story of mm -hmm. police brutality within mm -hmm. their classrooms. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is a, an effective route going forward, given what we have at the federal level right now? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's a more practical way of being able to address community concerns? So I think the, the um, again, remembering reparations that at its root is about repair. Mm -hmm. and how do we repair yes. communities? How do we repair in, individuals that have been wrong, descendants mm -hmm. uh, that have been wrong? How do we repair the, the, uh, um, the whole country, the whole sure. world? And in that regards, I think then, yes, we can see efforts at every at every level, at local levels, at at, at state levels, um, you know, also <clears throat> not just in the public sector, but even the private sector. Some of the very interesting work that has been going on, um, attorneys have been looking at corporations that um, uh, existed during the time of enslavement mm -hmm. that benefited from, made profits off of slavery that are still in operation today. Right. How do those corporations want to, to, to repair right. uh, their relationships with, uh, w uh, within the community in terms of having started on the basis of um, uh, human trafficking Absolutely. and having started on the basis of, of the enslavement of human beings? Don't you want to uh, do better, some of these insurance companies out there. So uh, I, I think that at every level, at, uh, to individual corporations, to churches, sure. uh, we've got a lot of churches around here that uh, um, uh, that have been continuously operating, where some of the uh, earliest ministers um, had human human beings held as slaves. Wow. You know what might they want want to do about that? Bob Romer um, is one of our. Uh, um, physicist turned historian mm -hmm. who has done a lot of work on uh, this area of the valley from Deerfield to Amherst mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and notably in his research are the, uh, uh, is evidence about the, the enslavement of, uh, of African people here uh, uh, into the 1800s that, that went on. So where's our responsibility here to teach about that, to educate about that, to provide proper uh, uh, markers and, and, uh, uh, and, and to find ways to, again, repair uh, the, the harm, the damage that was done. Sure. And so in terms of the uh, Democratic presidential candidates mm -hmm. who've been talking about this issue recently and have made it into a campaign issue, um, what do you think that is going to do in terms of giving this issue momentum? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's significance in what they're saying? And do you feel like the, some of the issue, some of the policies that they're suggesting are um, actually, you know, concrete proposals that are actually going to, um, you know, uh, address some of the historical injustice and sort of repair intercommunal relations. Here's what I would, would say. Um, you know, even right now, if every African-American in the United States was a millionaire, 
there'd still be a just basis mm -hmm. for reparations. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling that in the election, um, uh, on the Republican side, um, the, if, if Donald Trump is, the, is their nominee, um, that he will point to the low unemployment rates and this, that, and I quickly answer that by saying, well, you know, whatever the, however low the unemployment rate is under Trump, uh, that's nothing. Uh, it, we had absolute 100% full employment under slavery. <laughs> so what does what does a low unemployment rate right. really mean right. to this? And and so again, even if all African Americans in this country were, were were millionaires, none of them living below the poverty line, none of their children on free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch, even if we were all doing wonderfully well in millionaires, there would be a legitimate Absolutely. basis for reparations. And again, it wouldn't necessarily have to be in the form of a check, or even if it was, if we were all millionaires, we could take that check and then donate it to a, to a trust. Yes, yes. To a trust that could do things like, again, educate about our history, that could do things like, you know, uh, properly remember this tragedy such that we never let it happen again, such that we never engage in human trafficking again, such that we never uh, uh, wrongfully take from a people from from a, from a, a, another land and uh, suppress their rights and and force them to 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 work for nothing. Right. That's that's the real issue here, and uh, I'd like to think that our um, that that candidates on whatever side of the, the partisan divide would begin to grasp this and could talk to these issues in, in really meaningful ways. Um, I don't expect much on, on the Republican side. It does look like maybe on the Democratic side uh, there will be some, uh, uh, that, that some of the candidates are stepping forward to, to really interrogate the issue and look deeply at, at this. Because, uh, you know, as the writings of Ta-Nehisi Coates and, mm -hmm. and others have pointed out, pointed out, we can really see the thread, the, 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 the long, uh, a journey that an uh, impact that slavery has had and continues to have in a in such a corrosive way on the lives of people in in, in this country and especially on African Americans straight to our current issues of mass incarceration mm -hmm. millions mm -hmm. of people in prison like that so I think we've, we we hopefully will have uh, uh, a, a, a more um, more information, better debate of these issues in the upcoming election, but, uh, but I don't uh, hold out uh, too much hope from that. I wish we could continue the conversation, Professor Shabazz, because we've run out of time, but thank you so much for your insights and great. expertise, appreciate and we really appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. uh, until next time, this is your host, Mehla Qasamdhani.